And then my son was diagnosed with autism. I quit. And um, because they said there was no cure, no treatment, no information. I was like, I'm a hedge fund manager. I can deconstruct things. And so I built an AI team and then did a literature analysis of all the autism literature to try and figure out the commonalities and then drug repurposing. So focusing on GABA glutamate balance in the brain. GABA is what you get when you pop a Valium. It calms you down and glutamate excites you. You know, and so in kids and people with ASD, it's like there's too much noise going on. It's like when you're tapping your leg and you can't focus. And so that's why you get this sensitivity. Sometimes they can't speak like my son. And so it was like mechanisms to bring that down that then allowed to have applied behavioral analysis and these other things to reconstruct his speech. And then he went to mainstream school, which is pretty cool. It's unbelievable. I, I, I heard you said on another podcast and I was astounded and inspired by it. We mentioned before, you know, my mother's got MS mm. and I hate the doomsday only version of kind of AI and the future of you know, GBT. You said to me before about its impact on health and MS in particular and other conditions. How can it be used so transformatively to solve some of the world's most challenging chronic conditions? So I think a large part of our problem is that we can't scale because information flow is so limited as we write these things down. Like you can never capture all of that. So anyone who's had a loved one that has one of these conditions knows how difficult it is because you go from specialist to specialist to specialist and you try to build that mental map. And we're so lucky that we have so much access. But why isn't it that we can't just push a button and see every clinical trial and a deconstruction of all those and things? What if you had a thousand GPT-4s organizing all that knowledge and then make it available to everyone so you can see the exact potential mechanisms that by which MS works and all the potential food, other things that work with that. So as you try different things with your family member, you can see, well, she reacted this way to the food or this way to this medicine. And it's a more holistic thing because you can have personalized medicine versus one specialist for a thousand people. You can have a thousand GPT-4s or equivalents or MedPalm 2s for you. So we need to organize all this knowledge and then use these language models and others to make it accessible to you. I'm really naive and, and uh, basic in terms of my thinking, which is why I'm a venture capitalist. Uh, <laughs> but my question is, what do we need to do to get to that state? When we look at the data needed from the individuals, the data the, data the GPTs need, how we make the models work most efficiently? So what first, do we need? First, we don't have to have that data from individuals. So we had Galactica as a lang scientific language model, but now we have MedPalm 2 that exceeds doctor level. So that was a Google announcement yesterday. We have AIs that can understand articles better, as good as doctors, shall we say now. So we can scale that, because why do you need one when you have a thousand? So we take the existing generalized knowledge and all the hypotheticals, and we bring that together into an integrated common system available to everyone, because the building blocks are nearly here for that. Then you can personalize it later. And again, there are regulations and things around that to how you're, again, how we treat our loved ones and other things like that. But the first thing is, let's get all the knowledge in one place and make it organized and useful. And so I think we're at that point now where the language models have just hit that point that we can organize all of the world's Alzheimer's knowledge, longevity knowledge, autism knowledge, MS knowledge, and you can just type. And it can say, this is the source. This is what it looks like. These are some hypotheticals. This is what we know, what we know we don't know, what we think we might know, et cetera. And then it can learn about you and your queries. Because this is the other thing about lots of the language model things we've seen right now. They are one-to-one -one goldfish memory. The next step is one-to-one -one it remembers what you're asking for, like a cookie or an embedding. And then it's you plus a thousand of these language models all going and doing your bidding, the agent-based kind of thing. Does this get around the incentive problem in healthcare? And what I mean by the incentive problem in healthcare is I'm sure you know there are a lot of diseases actually where it doesn't make kind of economic sense for a lot of pharmaceutical providers to chase research, to chase treatments because it's not a big enough market, because it's not, because it's a $6 treatment. Does this solve for that economic misalignment? I think it can help a lot with that economic misalignment because then you have an authoritative source where we can all come together and build that can analyze these things because there's this concept of ergodicity. A thousand coins tossed in a row is the same as a thousand coins tossed at once. And because we're so limited in our information in our medical system, like, you know, I just had my key man insurance where I had to answer 40 minutes of questions. <laughs> have you smoked? Have you done this? It's stupid, right? We're all treated the same. Um, uh, I think 10% of people have a cytochrome P450 mutation in their liver, which means they metabolize drugs fast quicker. So if you metabolize codeine, it turns into morphine or fentanyl kills you. But that's a very basic genetic test, yet we give everyone 500 milligrams of the same thing. With my son, a microdose of five milligrams of clonazepam, which is used for anxiety disorder, worked with a neurologist, allows him to sing. 
The standard dose is a thousand milligrams. So they can only prescribe it at a thousand, but that is a six dollar a year treatment that affects his GABA glutamate balance, but only for his specific type of ASD, which is only seven percent of all kids with ASD. But why would that be in a pharmaceutical company's interest? You know, because how are they going to make money off a six dollar a year treatment? Well, I mean, how many people have ASD? Uh, it's one in sixty. Okay, so one in sixty. So you've got a million people in the UK. Yes. So you've got a six million dollar. Yeah, it's not great. <laughs> exactly, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like we know the benefits of vitamin D, right? But we still don't prescribe that at scale, and so many people are deficient. I, I mean, you know, all the, these things. The joys of doing what I do is going on schedule. Final one, and then we will kind of retain some form of normality of schedule. What does the future of healthcare systems look like? Do you think with GPT models operating in this way? I think that you can change the nature of a doctor because a lot of the stuff is kind of very basic. I think you know you had Babylon Health and others trying that chatbot; it wasn't ready. Now you've got this. Everyone should have their own AIs looking out for their own health with that objective function, you know? And then the nature of a doctor becomes different in terms of they have more rich information about an individual while it being preserved in a private manner. I think what you have is you have things like processes and procedures improving, like uh, wound care, for example, in the NHS. Um, if you are injured as an elderly person and your wounds aren't treated properly, you're more likely to die by a factor of eight times. Being able to monitor those types of things with this information set means you're eight times less likely, and then you have far more efficiency around that. So the information density around healthcare improves, which means that then our own healthcare improves. We all have access to as much knowledge as we want to within our own context, and so do our providers and the people that help us. How do we think about open source versus closed source human healthcare data? Because like obviously for us all to benefit as one, you know, MS sufferers around the world need to submit their data around you know, responses to certain treatments. Yeah. So I think the wonderful thing about these models is they're few shot learners, so they don't need to have much information. And so isn't the classical big data problem. HDR UK has been one of the pioneers here with the UK Biobank, Federated Learning and others. And there are kind of, um, with FL7, HLIR and other standards being built around this to allow for full federated learning. If you have open source language models that are fully auditable, understand, I call them organic free range models, the ones we're building with no web scrape data, those can sit on device. Like Google yesterday announced um, Palm 2. Yeah. The smallest Palm 2 model is 400 million parameters. It works on your Google Pixel phone. You don't need giant models anymore. And then that model can just share the specific information that preserves your privacy with the bigger thing. And then it can take from that global knowledge base as well. So you'll have big global models, on-device models. And I think open works for that because you don't need to have all the data open. You just need to know that Harry is old enough to have a drink, not that all the details about Harry and his birthplace and everything like that. He's old enough, he's just not allowed to. <laughs> he 